Star Wars was never really my thing as a kid. I grew up when the prequels were coming out, but I wasn't all that interested. I was much more a Harry Potter kind of a kid, or Narnia or Redwall. My mom tried to get me into Star Wars at an early age, so early that I didn't remember a single thing that I watched. As a result, for all intents and purposes, I didn't see the original trilogy until I was in college. And I only saw the prequels as an adult, so yeah, there's no real nostalgic connection for me. So my relationship with these movies is different from most other people, and I thought, what the hell, that can be content, right? The thing that does fascinate me about this franchise is that it seems every single person has a different opinion on it. So I figure it would be fun to share my own Star Wars opinions as bad and terrible as they might to be. But that reminds me. <clears throat> the following video is entirely my opinion, and while I welcome discussion about points of disagreement, there's no need for personal insults or anger in the comments. The words of a cartoon goat should not be seen as an attack on your own opinions. You're free to dislike movies that I like, or like movies that I dislike, and while that should be an obvious statement, it still needs to be explicitly said. With that said, let's dive in, shall we? Star Wars, full stop, came out in 1977 and was a sensation. People raved about its effects, its story, the music. Star Wars mania gripped the world and... Yeah, the movie's pretty freaking amazing. I just really admire its earnestness and its simplicity. Evil Empire likes to kill people. Main character doesn't like when they do that to his family. He makes giant super weapon go boom. It's that simple, really. It wears its heart on its sleeve. And it's really good at eliciting just the right emotion at the right time. And I know some people point and laugh at it now for being hokey, and the tropes have been done to death, but I want you to try something. Turn on the movie, ignore the A New Hope subtitle, and pretend it's 1977. You don't even know what a Star Wars is. The highest grossing films of all time are movies like Gone with the Wind, The Sound of Music, The Godfather, and Jaws. The most prominent science fiction work around is Star Trek on television, which, you know, is like this. <laughs> You sit down in the theater, see those opening words, and then... Beyond electrifying, isn't it? Now what I really like about this movie is just how quirky it is. Again, forget the non-stop advertising blitz that Star Wars has been on for almost 50 years, and really listen to the synopsis. Princess Leia is attacked by Darth Vader, an agent of the Galactic Empire under the command of the Grand Moff Tarkin. So she hides important intel in a droid called R2-D2, who is accompanied by his friend C-3PO, a droid devoted to human-cyborg relations. They are launched to the desert planet of Tatooine, where they meet Luke Skywalker, who is a moisture farmer and Obi-Wan Kenobi, one of the last of an ancient order called the Jedi. Let's be frank, it's all very silly when you stop to think about it, but the movie gives all of this with a straight face, and that's part of what I love about it. There's no wink wink nudge nudge, oh this is ridiculous isn't it? It's all told with a sincere attitude. Even considering that though, it's a miracle that this movie comes together the way it does. The script is basically off-brand Flash Gordon after George Lucas couldn't get the rights to well, Flash Gordon. Then he filmed the movie, and the first screening was... terrible. But his wife Marsha Lucas took the movie, gave it a sharp edit that cut out extraneous scenes, rearranged them, and the result she gave us was a perfectly paced movie that never leaves us bored, but never leaves us struggling to catch up either. Every element comes and goes exactly when it needs to, and makes this fantastical world so easy to slip into. And the pacing also lets the movie breathe, which is so important. One of my favorite scenes, no joking, is this. It highlights my favorite element in this movie, the way it quietly builds this massive world that we only see a tiny slice of. 
What is this droid used for? Or this one? The fact that Jawas don't speak English shows that across this galaxy, hell, even on the same planet, of course people don't all speak the same language. It adds to the sense of this massive universe with surprises around every corner. Who the heck is this guy? What the heck is this guy? Or this guy or that guy? Star Wars is just so weird and wonderful and I love it. It invites us to use our own imagination to consider the possibilities of what's just beyond our sight. That's what I really love about this movie. It takes this really solid, simple story and frames it in a whimsical atmosphere. In a sense, my favorite parts of Star Wars are when it feels like a fantasy movie, and that's what Star Wars 77 absolutely excels in. It's just a delight from beginning to end. Iconic is a word that's abused a lot, but I think it absolutely applies here. There's a good reason this film is a cornerstone in the history of cinema. It's endlessly lovable and truly special in a way that's virtually impossible to recapture. And they never have recaptured it. 1980, The Empire Strikes Back. The sequel to what was, at the time, the highest grossing movie ever. A continuation of the story of Luke Skywalker in the aftermath of the Death Star's destruction. The film acclaimed as the 22nd greatest movie of all time on the letterbox. Universally loved. But, you know, I... Uh, yeah. uh, okay, look, look. I like it. I do enjoy this movie. It has great action in it and really fantastic scenes and interesting concepts. It's a good movie, but I don't think it's a good sequel to Star Wars? No, no, please, don't click or swipe off the video, I can explain. I'm not trying to pedal in shock value, I swear. I do feel like something changed in the heart of the story here. A change that, I argue, ultimately broke the franchise. And that change is that Luke becomes far more important, both in a more meta-narrative sense and within the world of the story. For the first of these issues, I want to ask a simple question. What do Han and Leia do in this movie? Han saves Luke from the frozen night on Hoth, and then Leia and Lando save Luke at the end of the movie. In between, they flirt, get chased by the Empire, flirt, get chased by a worm, flirt, get chased by a bounty hunter, then they get captured and held as a trap for Luke. I guess the romantic drama is something, though it's written like this. Why you stuck up? Half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder! Luke gets the lion's share of plot action. The ghost of Obi-Wan appears to him like a video game marker to tell him where his next quest is. He goes to Dagobah and meets Yoda. I love Yoda. His quirky mannerisms and humble home belie a very wise soul. And my favorite scene in this movie is when he tells Luke about the mystical ways of the Force. Life creates it. Makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us and binds us. Luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. It is in this moment that I think Empire does manage to capture the soul of Star Wars. This funny little goblin man who lives in a swamp has such wonder and awe in his voice. You can feel his respect for this mysterious force, and we can't help but feel the same way. This is exactly the kind of fantastical feeling I want in a Star Wars movie. But then, something happens. Han and Leia are captured, and Luke can feel their peril via the Force. When he rushes to help them, he confronts Vader, gets his butt handed to him, and then we get this iconic line. One of the most famous lines in all of cinema. I don't even have to play the audio, you know what Vader's said in this moment. And it is this moment that I think broke Star Wars. Because suddenly, Luke is no longer a humble farmer boy who happened to be at the right place at the right time to become a hero. He was always destined for greatness. It's his destiny to defeat the Emperor. After Empire Strikes Back, the story of Star Wars is not about the galaxy, it's only about Luke. He's no longer a small part of a larger world, he is the center of this world, and it starts to make the world feel smaller. It's not a serious problem in this film, or even in the next film. Practically imperceptible. But I'd argue there is a straight line between I am your father and Rey Skywalker. And I will deal with that when I get there. 
Again, there is quite a bit I like about Empire Strikes Back. It's well paced, very snappy, and it does deliver a hearty dose of the space age fantasy that I loved in Star Wars, but just not as much as the original. 1983, Return of the Jedi. So this is kind of a strange one. It feels almost like three completely different movies stitched together. The first part is everything at Jabba's palace, where Luke goes to retrieve Han's body. And it's like this. They want to wonder. Oh How many languages do you speak? I am fluent in over six million forms of communication and can readily splendid. It reminds me of the cantina scene from Star Wars, but stretched out even longer. And I'm kinda into it, actually. There's so many weird and wacky designs, just sheer puppet-led chaos, and I'm here for it. The Rancor, the Sarlacc Pit, whatever the hell this is. And even with the special edition changes, it just contributes to the madness. Even if they are a bit, uh... uh, uh much. But then we get to the second part where, surprise, there's another Death Star. And now they gotta go blow it up again, and we end up on Endor where we meet these things. And, um, I really love the Ewoks too, actually. Sure, they come out of nowhere, and they're made to sell toys, but I'm delighted by the idea of a race of cannibalistic teddy bears. It's hilarious. It's weird because these things are all basically side stops and diversions that barely connect to the main plot. By all accounts, they should be trimmed down to focus on the actual story. But I don't want them trimmed down because they're my favorite parts. Oh, we also got this twist that Leia's Luke's sister, which again makes the world shrink down even more because the Skywalker bloodline is even more important now. Anyways, the third part is the most emotional story where Luke is trying to reach out to his father, Darth Vader, because he believes there's still good in him. So he willingly turns himself in and gets brought before the Emperor. A face we didn't even see in Star Wars and only shown briefly in Empire. And honestly, Ian McDermott is amazing in this role. He's just over the top and cheesy in all the right ways. I assure you, we are quite safe from your friends here. Your overconfidence is your weakness. Your faith in your friends is yours. This. This is the kind of big bad that Star Wars deserves. But there's one thing about this scene that gets to me, and it's this speech to Luke. Take your weapon. Strike me down with all of your hatred, and your journey towards the dark side will be complete. So here's the thing. Luke's ideals are being challenged by the Emperor's mind games. And the idea is that if Luke kills him out of hatred, then he will be evil too. Sure, fine, whatever. But what makes this so funny to me is that he pulls the same thing over and over again in the franchise, and it always works. So my interpretation is he just whips this out like verbal pocket sand to confuse his enemies. Aw, oh, shit, I stepped too far. Uh, how do I get out of this? I can Shit, she actually got here. Uh, think fast, Palpy. Uh. You want to kill me? That is what I want. With your hatred, you will take my life. Even in the extended universe games, he's like, Oh shit, Vader's apprentice is gonna kill me. Uh, uh. You were destined to destroy me. Do it. Give in to your hatred. It's his get out of death free card, and I love it. But anyways, Luke refuses to kill, the Emperor tries to kill, and then Darth Vader kills. Man, what a great death scene. And so final, too. No way anyone could possibly come back from being incinerated like that. Luke and Vader share a moment, and he's given a proper pyre, as the galaxy celebrates the fall of the Empire. The end. It's alright, honestly, the movie. It's disjointed and weird, but it caps off the saga well enough. If you take these three movies as a whole, you get a pretty solid series. It's easy to see why it's so beloved, and I truly think that anyone can get at least something from the original Star Wars trilogy.
But it didn't stop there. So if I went back in time to 1995 and met a Star Wars fan and they asked me, Hey, what will the new Star Wars prequels be about? I would say, first of all, buy Apple stock right now. Second, the Star Wars prequel trilogy will follow Anakin Skywalker, a young man who idolizes the Jedi Order as he grows disillusioned with their complacency. He finds himself manipulated by Senator Palpatine, who seeks to circumvent the decadent Galactic Republic and subvert it to his own whims, in a dramatic display of democracy devolving into dictatorship. And they would say, Wow! That sounds amazing! And they'd be right, it is a great concept. Then the movie would come out and they would see this. You, sir, have a live play with this and his and... Uh-huh. Be gone with him! Yeah, there's infamously a certain, uh, disconnect between the concept of the prequels and their execution. So when I watched The Phantom Menace for the first time, its reputation preceded it, and I braced myself for the worst, but honestly, I kinda like it? Now don't get me wrong, I can't call it a good movie by any stretch of the imagination. The plot spirals out of control, the characters aren't compelling, the dialogue is... I'm ambassador to the Supreme Chancellor. I'm taking these people to Coruscant. Where are you taking them? To Coruscant. You know, like that. Anakin being an immaculate conception rivals Man of Steel and ham-fisted Christ comparisons. And again, makes the universe revolve ever more around the Skywalker bloodline. But at the same time, it's just so odd and bizarre that I can't help but be fascinated by it. Like, look at this scene. We we'll let the fate decide, huh? I just happen to have a chance cube here. Watto called a die a chance cube. There is no good reason for George Lucas to come up with a whole new fantastical word for dice. But he did. He did that. For us. The computer effects have obviously not aged well, but at the same time, I'm glad they at least tried them. Because Jar Jar Binks looked like this, future movies could look like this, or have effects as good as this. Does it make these scenes look better? No. But at the same time, I can't feel that angry about it. Another point in Phantom's favor is that it's pretty fast-paced. I can't say well-paced, because again, the story has no sense of direction at all, but at least it can trick you into thinking it's going somewhere. It doesn't languish or stagnate. And on top of that, you have John Williams' score, which kicks butt. Again, it's a bad movie. I'm not going to dispute that. But I have a hell of a time watching it, and honestly, that ironic enjoyment begins to coalesce into some degree of sincere enjoyment. That's more than I can say for some of these other movies. Like this one. Attack of the Clones is really, really boring. It's like after the backlash of The Phantom Menace, George Lucas decided to clam up all the fun wackiness, and now we're left with a joyless talk fest. And now to business. You will be delighted to hear that we are on schedule. Plot points that should be resolved in five minutes take fifty. There's little flair for any of the directing. I mean, look at this fight. <laughs> What is this? Anakin's path to the dark side is laughably faltering. He doesn't have a character arc. He has a character cliff. They're like animals. And I slaughtered them like animals. I hate them. This isn't foreshadowing darker deeds. These are the dark deeds. He's not creeping closer to evil. He's jumping over the line and back again. It's not as funny as Phantom, and it's just so dull to watch. There are only three things I like in this movie. One, Ian McGregor's beard. Two, Ian McGregor in general. And three, the greatest comedic moment ever written in cinematic history. Now where are you taking me? This is such a drag. I'm quite beside myself. 
Actually, you know, I'll give it one more thing. The music is still good. John Williams is consistently great across the entire saga. He is the constant. At least until a certain finale, but again, we will get there when we get there. Revenge of the Sith is easily the best movie of the prequels, and the only one I'll say is kinda good? Though even that is questionable with some of these lines. You're so... beautiful. It's only because I'm so in love. No. <laughs> no, it's because I'm so in love with you. They're great for memes, not so great for a cinematic experience. Also, if you'll entertain my complaints just a little longer, I'm not a big fan of the character of General Grievous, who just pops up and steals Count Dooku's job as the secondary antagonist. Although this was an issue with the whole trilogy, I feel like these secondary villains would have been better if we'd only had one of them. Imagine for a second, if the same person who killed Qui-Gon, then confronted the heroes on Geonosis, then quote-unquote kidnapped Palpatine, before finally having the big showdown with Obi-Wan. Look at the Witch King of Angmar in The Lord of the Rings, the same guy who stabbed Frodo in the first part of the trilogy, returning time and again with the rest of the Nazgul to torment the heroes until he's finally defeated in the last part in a climactic showdown, a major stepping stone towards the real big bad Sauron. Pick one of these characters and develop them. As it is, Grievous feels more like a sideshow. And before you comment, oh, if you watch The Clone Wars, it fixes everything and fleshes out these characters. No, 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 stop, no. If the show does that, that means the show is good. That does not make these movies good. I shouldn't have to watch seven seasons of a series that came out after the film for the movie to make sense. But that said, let me focus on something I do like in this film. You're the Sith Lord. I know what's been troubling you. Listen to me. Don't continue to be a pawn of the Jedi Council. The A plot of this movie is still cheesy and melodramatic, sure, but the latter half is actually really solid. The moment when Chancellor Palpatine becomes Emperor Palpatine is such an effective scene, and for once the dialogue is actually pretty damn clever. This wordless scene where they're allowed to act without weird things coming out of their mouth? There are good scenes in this movie. Now don't get me wrong, the story still has its contrivances. Having Yoda say, Ooh, the force clouding my judgment is, is just flat out bad writing. Just have them make a choice that ends up being the wrong choice. That's how drama works. And Padme dying of sadness is... Do I even have to explain? Like, really? So, yeah, it's not evenly good, but at the same time, it feels like this movie comes the closest to achieving what George Lucas wanted to do. I know this will sound weird, because so far I've criticized Revenge of the Sith about twice as long as I've praised it, but I find the second half of this movie genuinely compelling. More compelling than it has any right to be, considering the rest of the prequel trilogy building up to it. Also, a major credit I'll give this movie is that it ends on a downer note. That's very risky for a big blockbuster. I mean, you look at Empire Strikes Back. Han gets captured and Luke loses his hand. A setback for the heroes, but nothing they don't come back from by the beginning of the next movie. Revenge of the Sith ends with Palpatine exterminating the Jedi and plunging the galaxy into three decades of autocratic terror. Sure, we already know he gets defeated three movies from now, and the film sows those seeds of hope. But that doesn't change the fact that Palpatine straight up wins in this movie. And then near the very end we have Padme's funeral, and the score leads into that dramatic reworking of the Imperial March. This gives me genuine chills. I wish the rest of the prequel trilogy was like this. I dare say it even legitimizes episodes 1 and 2 a bit more, if only because they led to a movie that I sincerely like. It's definitely hokey and melodramatic. Anakin, Chancellor Palpatine is evil! From my point of view, the Jedi are evil! Well then you are lost! But honestly, it's just enough to the point where it's a lot of fun to watch. It's silly, but also has a genuinely good ish story behind it. So anyways, that's the prequel trilogy. Will I say it's good? Eh, 
No, not really. I feel like part of the backlash against Disney Star Wars has been an attempt to rehabilitate the prequel trilogy and say that they're really good and secretly brilliant works of art and... Really, guys? These movies? I'll grant that I don't think they're as bad as their reputation implied, but movies don't exist in a binary of utter trash and brilliant masterpieces. The prequels have some virtues, but they also have many, many flaws. Again, great concept, horrifically messy execution. So, now we get to move on to the internet's favorite discussion topic. Okay, before we get into this, I want to reiterate. I'm not going to point fingers. I'm not here to rage against anything. I'm just saying my personal thoughts. Now, The Force Awakens has a special spot in my heart for a particular reason. My mom's been a fan of Star Wars since the very beginning, and this one, Episode 7, was the first Star Wars movies that I saw with her in cinemas. I love my mom, and this is a treasured memory for me. And let me tell you, we had a hell of a time. It was full of excitement, adventure, intrigue. It got us hyped up for the new Star Wars movies that were coming out. A new, grand adventure to look forward to over the next few years. Of course, all the movies are out now. And my experience with cinema has grown since then, so I rewatched it recently to see how my opinion changed. But surprisingly, no, my opinion on this movie hasn't really changed that much. It's still a sleek and snazzy adventure that I have a lot of fun in. As far as blockbuster tentpole movies go, it looks great. I really like the cinematography of a lot of these shots. They often lend a truly epic feeling to the story. The effects are fantastic, and has plenty of smaller details that help to ground the film in my eyes. It's got a lot of that visual world building I loved in the original. And more weird stuff. This is what I love, the weird stuff. As for the story, I think it's solidly written. I know it's easy to dismiss it as a rehash of 1977, and granted, the surface level plot details are lifted directly. A loner on a desert planet gets sucked into galactic conflict where they meet a droid, meet a mentor who fought through the previous major conflict, they go to a cantina to find help, and then they team up with other heroes to blow up a planet killer superweapon. Also, the ending has this kind of lame cop-out where it turns out BB-8's map is only partially complete. You're wasting your time. It is very doubtful that R2 would have the rest of the map in his backup data. The map. It is complete. Luke. But this movie also sets up characters that are poised to tell starkly unique stories. Rey isn't a wistful farm girl wanting more excitement in her life. She doesn't even really want to escape Jakku. Instead, she feels an obligation to stay because she expects her family to return for her. She's young, scrappy, and Daisy Ridley really brings a sweet charm to this character. Now, I know some of you want me to address whether or not she's this. Well, the thing is, I'm not going to touch that. I'm not even going to say the word on my channel. It's a phrase so misused and abused in pop culture that the term is functionally meaningless. To me, it's an uninteresting and legalistic way to approach movie criticism. Making sure a character checks all the boxes for every ability they display in the same way a record keeper checks a video game speedrun for cheating. Regardless of if Rey should be able to fight as well as she does, despite having to literally fight for her survival for years, or be as knowledgeable as she is, though she does scavenge broken ships for a living, or be as strong in the Force as she is, You will remove these restraints and leave this cell with the door open. I will remove these restraints and leave the cell with the door open. Okay, that one is a little convenient, but all of that is of only tertiary concern to me. When it comes down to it, the discussion is irrelevant to Rey's motivation because her goal isn't fighting bad guys. Her real conflict centers on finding her family and the emotional journey that comes with that. Speaking of family, I love how Han Solo switches gears to a mentor role and takes her under his wing. He's a lot of fun in this movie, and Harrison Ford manages a natural balance between being a smart aleck and being genuinely caring. I like what they do with him here. Oscar Isaac as Poe Dameron is also a lot of fun. 
Unfortunately, he's not in this movie too much, but from what we do see of him, he's got a cocky upstart feel to him. He's already a die-hard resistance fighter, and I like his snark. It has a different sense of humor than the original trilogy, sure, but different doesn't equal bad. And I quite like his energy. John Boyega as Finn is my favorite character among the trio. I mean, a stormtrooper who doesn't want to be a stormtrooper? I'd never seen that before. And again, before I mention the Clone Wars, I've not seen the show, I'm not gonna see it, I'm just focusing on the movies here. But this made my jaw drop in the theaters. This moment where he doesn't pull the trigger, this moment changes everything. It changes the way we see this conflict, it changes the way we see this world. On top of that, I just have a blast with his everyman personality. Sure, it's a little off-putting how eagerly he blasts his former comrades during the escape scene, but I believe Finn in The Force Awakens had the potential to be an incredible co-protagonist. Had. The potential. Now, if there's any flaw in this movie, it's that it relies too much on other movies. Callbacks to previous films in the franchise can get gratuitous. Having Rey and Finn jump on the Millennium Falcon is fine. Having Finn lean too hard on the table to activate the hollow chest is excessive. At the same time, it also stakes too much on future films in the franchise. Star Wars 77 had a self-contained story, beginning, middle, end, roll credits, complete package. Here, these characters are explicitly written to have incomplete arcs because the movie is counting on later entries to complete them. A lot of story elements set up future payoffs. Where'd you get that? A good question. For another time. And that's fine as long as the filmmakers actually have an idea of what those payoffs will be. But every time a question is left unanswered, the movie basically cuts a check that will have to be cashed in the future. And, as you might be aware, not everything did get a satisfying payoff. And that does undermine this movie in retrospect. But one element of this movie actually got stronger in my rewatch, and that's Kylo Ren. Kylo Ren, or Ben Solo, is the most consistently good part of the sequel trilogy. And I'm not just saying that because he's played by Adam Driver, a truly beautiful man. A, a, a lot of people in 2015 dismissed him as a whinier and less composed version of Darth Vader. But looking back, this was a great setup. Yes, he is emotionally immature unstable, totally unfit to lead. Each of these aspects make him an interesting character. And once you know how his story ends, so many things hit harder. If you see our son, bring him home. Oh, my heart. So it's not perfect, but honestly it's better than I remembered it being on rewatch. And even knowing that these infamous mystery boxes don't get resolved, it's hard to not get sucked back in. It was an incredibly strong hook for the new era of Star Wars, and I still enjoy it today. Now, next on my list is, uh, 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 one. Yes, that's the movie that came out next. Let's talk about that one. When I first saw Rogue One in theaters, I thought it was awesome. It's dark, gritty, really puts the war in the Star War. Then I visited it for this video and, eh, well, uh, eh, eh. For me, Rogue One feels like two very different movies. The final third of this film is very good. It's exciting, and the cinematography makes the viewer feel like they're on the ground in the middle of the battle. There's a lot of twists and turns and tension as they try to execute their mission, and seeing each member of the ensemble cast fall in the battle drives home just how much was at stake here. This shot on the beach, as two of our main heroes hug each other, Jin Erso looking on and crying as the blast from the Death Star rushes at them, genuinely moves me. If the entirety of Rogue One was like this, I would love it. The problem is, the first two-thirds of this movie are really dull. Not a lot happens because it wants to be a character drama, and it pretends to be a character drama, but there's not a lot of character to give us that drama. This ain't no Snowpiercer, I'm afraid. 
The film tries to build these characters by outright expositing to us. The last time I saw you, you gave me a knife and loaded blaster and told me to wait in a bunker till daylight. I knew you were safe. Grace Morbis was once the most devoted guardian of us all. You left me behind. You were already the best soldier in my country. I was 16. I was protecting you. You dumped me. You were the daughter of an Imperial science officer. I've been in this fight since I was six years old. But there's just too many people for anything to connect. I honestly forgot some of these people were even in the movie. It's a shame because these are interesting concepts for characters. A blind half-Jedi monk, the heavy gunner that protects him, the daughter of a disgraced Imperial engineer, a defecting Imperial pilot, a rebel who does the dirty work for the Alliance, and a snarky security droid sound like they'd make for a colorful ensemble cast. But most of them don't have a strong motivation through the story. The film has a very grim and dour feel to it, which is then strangely undercut with quips here and there. It doesn't fully commit to the war drama route. And I get that they probably didn't want to do that because, well, it's Star Wars, and Disney is a family-friendly brand. But if they weren't going to fully commit, maybe they shouldn't have taken that approach in the first place. Again, once the action starts and the movie has stuff actually happening, it's really exciting. But it takes itself far too seriously and acts like it's a lot deeper than it really is. Jin's character arc from... The Alliance, the, the Rebels, whatever it is you're calling yourself these days. All it's ever brought me is pain. My father was living proof and you put him at risk. That's what Alliance bombs that killed him. Two. If the Empire has this kind of power, what chance do we have? What chance do we have? The question is what choice? Rebellions are built on hope. It just feels rushed and not very compelling. Also, this thing is... weird. And this is coming from the guy that likes the weird Star Wars stuff. This is just... too weird and out of nowhere. I'm sorry, Rogue One fans. If it's any consolation, I do like this part where Jin grabs a gun and the stormtrooper just falls off the platform. But I think what frustrates me the most about this movie is again, the fan service. It was at this point when I was starting to notice it. Disney is bringing people back from the dead with CGI because they need to have this character that people recognize in this movie. We need to bring back James Earl Jones, who sounds more tired than ever, because we can't have the story be about Director Krennic. It needs to be about Darth Vader and Grand Moff Tarkin. But more than that, we need to explain every bit of Star Wars lore. A space station the size of a moon having exhaust ports the size of a womp rat is... Oh, well, I don't know how big a womp rat is, but it sounds like it'd be small. The whole point of Luke's victory being so spectacular in Star Wars 77 is that hitting this itty bitty target was so unlikely. Great shot, kid! That was one in a million! But it became a meme that <laughs> it was so easy to shoot at that particular spot and the whole thing blew up. It was a joke that Disney apparently treated as an actual plot hole. Because now the weakness of the Death Star was planted on purpose by an insider with rebel sympathies. I see people on Letterboxd calling this an essential Star Wars story, but is it though? Star Wars at its best invites us to use our imagination. This style of storytelling demands we surrender our imagination. Instead, we need to be spoon-fed every last bit of information now. We've lost engine power, sir! That Star Destroyer's disabled! Now let's move on to the next movie, which is... Uh... <laughs> Solo, the other spin-off movie, which I'm sure didn't make any of the mistakes I just mentioned. I'm gonna be a pilot. Best in the galaxy. What's your name, son? Hot. Um, what? Who are your people? I don't have people. I'm alone. Um... Solo. Good luck, Han Solo. We'll have you flying in no time. Um, oh god, um, maybe I can, uh, talk about, uh... Guess I can't delay it anymore, can I? Roll the title card.
So, if you're watching a Star Wars video on YouTube, you know that Last Jedi opinions seem to be on a binary of flawless masterpiece and the worst movie ever made. I disagree heartily with both statements. Keep in mind, once again, I'm not here to play the blame game. I really like Ryan Johnson's filmography, and he's actually one of my favorite filmmakers working today. You listen to him speak about storytelling, and it's clear that the man knows what he's talking about. Hitchcock hated whodunits, famously, and his whole thing about whodunits was it's a big build-up to one big surprise at the end, which was a very cheap coin for him, narratively. I'm thinking in terms of the audience's experience and what's drawing an audience through sequence by sequence. For, for each sequence, what are they worried about? I'm not going to blame Kathleen Kennedy because remember, if you hate this, but love these, she's credited as producer for all of it, regardless of what the rumor mill says. You're free to love this movie, you're free to hate this movie. We're going to have a nice, calm, civilized discussion about a Star Wars movie, okay? Okay, here we go. Now, Everything with Kylo Ren, Rey, and Luke Skywalker is honestly my favorite Star Wars. Seeing a hero tested like this is incredible. Even more than facing down Emperor Palpatine and Darth Vader, Luke facing his own mistakes gives us such a gripping story. He is messed up so badly that the galaxy is now in danger. He's torn between a resistance that desperately needs a heroic icon and the knowledge that he can't live up to his own legend. I can't be what she needs me to be. His ploy on Crate is the most Jedi thing that any Jedi has ever done in a Star Wars movie. Kylo Ren's conflicting loyalties boil over, and with that comes drastic consequences, like him smashing his helmet so we, we can see his face more. Look at him. I could fix him. And Rey finally confronts the family question in a brilliant payoff. Because no, The Last Jedi doesn't hand wave the question of who Rey's parents are. Instead, it confronts the root of the matter. She shouldn't care who her parents are in the first place. She explicitly says her goal here. I need someone to show me my place in all this. By finding out her parents were important, she would get that answer. But she doesn't. Saying her parents were filthy junk traders who sold her off for drinking money isn't a non-answer. If anything, it's the answer that makes the story more interesting, because now her character has to go to the next level down and confront her dependence on that answer. And Rey is so desperate for an answer that for the first time in this entire saga, I genuinely felt like a character might go to quote-unquote the dark side for it. Rey now has to define her own place in the world. Not to mention this development actively undoes the process started in Empire. Instead of hyper-focusing ever more on the Skywalkers, now Rey is also important. Look at that! Another Force user to shape the future of the story. I'm so happy for that! The Force becomes more interesting as a result. For the past several movies, it felt more like a video game power bar, but The Last Jedi begins to make it feel like a grand mystical energy again that is now manifesting in someone new, for mysterious reasons. Layer onto this some incredible visual directing, just as I would expect from Johnson, and it seems like this movie would top my list. Unfortunately, this movie has some serious problems too. The B plot with Finn, Rose, and Poe isn't as interesting or engaging as the A plot. And it's a shame because honestly, I like Rose Tico. Kelly Marie Tran is really sweet in this role, and I like the way we set up this backstory with her sister in a visual way through their matching amulets. Her character is someone who looks up to these heroes and then finds out they're not all they're cracked up to be. It complements Luke's conflict well, but the problem is that doesn't get followed through with. The B-plot feels unfocused, veering into the questions of war profiteering and class exploitation. And sure, these are interesting questions to explore, but it makes the movie feel less streamlined and dilutes this plot thread's relationship to the rest of the story. And I know that the whole thing of getting captured, escaping back to the base, and all this stuff ties into the theme of learning from failure. But just because I can see that it's thematically relevant doesn't mean it's tied in strongly. If I criticize anything about this movie, it's that it feels like half of the characters get assigned busy work through the runtime. Especially characters that have so much potential. The pacing is messy. 
The Last Jedi has two climaxes, and it feels like a whole trilogy got sandwiched into the runtime. And yet at the same time, it feels like some tidbits are missing. Whenever I watch it, and the First Order follows the Resistance through hyperspace, I mentally fill in the idea that the Resistance suspects a spy on board their ship. It explains why Vice Admiral Holdo is so tight-lipped about their plan, and why the Resistance leadership declines to support Finn, a former First Order soldier, on his mission. But that should have been in the text of the film, and these characters seem unnecessarily obstinate as a result. So yeah, it has several weak points, and I can see why people dislike it. But as for me, I still kind of like it. I enjoy the good parts enough that they outweigh the bad in my mind. If you want a full breakdown of the movie from someone who demonstrates an understanding of themes and character, I'd recommend Nero's A Guide to the Last Jedi, linked just above. He refutes a lot of the arguments I disagree with, and really pieces together things in a way that I just don't have the time or willpower to do so here. Well, the comments section is a flaming dumpster fire now. Let's get this over with. We've decoded the intel from the First Order spy, and it confirms the worst. Somehow Palpatine returned. The Rise of Skywalker is dumb and bad. Okay, okay, okay. Before I dig in, I'm going to say positive things, because there are things I liked in this movie. C-3PO was the funniest he's been in a long time. That was great. Kylo Ren has screen time. That's a plus in itself. And he even gets a character arc. The only character arc in the movie. That moment where he meets his father again in death, and they replay Han's death scene with a far different outcome, is really solid actually. Babu Frick is the greatest character to ever grace the silver screen. <sighs> but other than that, oh god, hold on, because this is about to get rough. I've got a whole 95 theses against The Rise of Skywalker that I'm about to nail to Lucasfilm's door. Right from the get-go, the movie has a breakneck pace that's dizzying to keep up with. It's headache-inducing. Remember how slow and steady the original movie was? The return of Palpatine is absolutely the worst that it could have been. Somehow Palpatine returned. And let me tell you why that's a problem. Anyone who knows me will tell you that I don't get too particular about details and explanations in films. I'll hand wave a lot if I'm invested in what's going on. How did the Joker think so far ahead in The Dark Knight? I don't know, I guess he's just really smart and lucky. Why couldn't the Eagles take the Fellowship to Mordor? A few reasons I can think of probably just wouldn't work. But when you do something as drastic as straight up resurrecting the former villain of the series, it raises a question. What stops them from doing it again? Apparently, in the novelization, it confirms that Palpatine was cloned, which I shouldn't have to buy the book to get essential plot information in the movie. Storytelling should not come with paid DLC. But also, if he was cloned, then what stops some Sith cultists from doing the same thing in episode 12 or whatever? When it's just hand waved away with. The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be. unnatural. Then, yeah, killing him is no gravity here and makes this whole thing feel pointless. Unless you identify the way he came back and stop it, he'll just return again the next time this franchise gets rebooted. You know how I gushed about these three characters in The Force Awakens? Their energy is straight up gone here. They constantly snipe at each other, there's no sense of camaraderie. Finn gets relegated to... And Poe Dameron does... Uh, what the hell did he even do through this whole trilogy? The Empress sent a ship from Exegol. Does that mean every ship in the fleet has, has planet-killing weapons? Of course they do. And Ray, well, <laughs> I'll get to that in a bit. The movie's find X to find Y to find Z scavenger hunt plot is so dry and uninteresting. 
I've heard it compared to a video game plot, but honestly, I've played Call of Duty games with more interesting stories than this. There's no room for drama or anything. The Last Jedi was far from perfect, but at least it was about something. Hell, the prequels were bad, but at least they were trying to be about something. And the climactic confrontation with Palpatine, it feels like the movie is actively avoiding having a theme. Rey confronts Palpatine with the intention of killing him, and he does the whole good, good, strike me down with your hatred bit. Because if she does that, then his spirit will possess her? And then she hesitates, as one would in that situation, and he replies, It's the only way to save your friends! And opens the sky view, and right here, Ray pauses, and as much as I disliked everything up to this point, I was hopeful. Because imagine this, where Ray takes a moment to weigh her options, and then actually does strike him down, not out of hatred, but out of love for her friends and a desire to protect them. That love is enough to counter Palpatine's sinister plan, and the galaxy is saved. But, no. Instead, she just has a lightsaber fight with more action figures, and then Kylo Ren shows up, and then Palpatine goes, Ooh, a Force Dyad! And then sucks her collective soul to get his body back, and then he goes, brr, 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 into the sky with his lightning, and then Rey gets up, and Palpatine says, I am inevitable! And Ray says, and I am Iron Man. And then reverse Uno cards his lightning back on him, which is now the third time he shocked himself to death in this franchise. I actually bust out laughing in the theater when we got a fourth planet-killing weapon in the series. Like, are you freaking kidding me? So many ideas to be tapped from the previous two films. Finn's unique angle as a former stormtrooper. Kylo wanting to destroy the light and dark binary of the Force. The glaring eyes of Hux waiting to stab him in the back. And the rise of Skywalker gave us another blow up the planet killer plot. I'm pissed that Rosico not only got sidelined in this movie, but obviously sidelined. Again, I won't blame anyone. I won't assume things I don't know about who called what shots. But there's a difference between just not writing her an active part and having a scene where they explicitly say, Sorry, Rose is not coming. Did you hear that in the theater? Rose is not coming. After the abuse Kelly Marie Tran received, this does peeve me. You know, I'm just saying. If you're going to have a part of the movie where the galaxy finally rises up in open revolt, it could be led by an idealistic woman who believes wholeheartedly in the resistance and has demonstrated her commitment to spreading its ideals and helping people in the past. Or you could just have a be a Lando Calrissian cameo. That works too. Maybe trans snub wasn't intentional. I won't assume it was, but it still ticks me off. Ray accidentally blows up Chewbacca. He's alive again the very next scene. C-3PO has his memory wiped. He's restored 45 minutes later. Nothing in this movie means anything, and it actively undoes anything in the previous movies that meant anything. And that brings me to... You are a Palpatine. Now, fun fact, back in 2016 or so, as we were anticipating episode 8, this was actually my theory. If the villain, Kylo Ren, was a Skywalker, it would be interesting if Rey was from the Palpatine bloodline, and a reversal of which side the family stood on. Then The Last Jedi came out, and I was wrong. And I was happy to be wrong, because the answer we got was more interesting and challenging for the character. I am not happy that episode 9 retcons that, even if it meant I was right in retrospect. It doesn't challenge the character, it gives Rey just what she wanted, the belief that her parents loved her. She doesn't have to struggle to find her place in the universe anymore, it's been handed to her on a silver platter. Now if this had actually been built towards and anticipated from episode 7, then maybe this would have worked better. And don't try to blame Ryan Johnson for messing up a plan, because... There was no plan. Episode 9 and JJ pitched me the film and was like, oh yeah, Palpatine's granddaddy. And I was like, awesome. And then two weeks later, he was like, oh, we're not sure. So it kept changing. So then even I was filming and I wasn't sure what the answer was going to be. They didn't know this core story beat even while they were in the middle of filming. A common refrain is that the sequel trilogy was bad because they didn't plan the story ahead. I mildly disagree because 
The original Star Wars trilogy wasn't planned ahead. Empire Strikes Back featured this kiss, and then they decided Luke and Leia were siblings in the next movie. But the difference is that A, even if they hammered out finer details in the middle of the production, they knew what the primary plot events would be before they started filming the cameras, and B, they built off of the previous films instead of trying to erase them. This is a small goof that's only a side story at most, laughed off now as an awkward little oopsie daisy. This is rewriting a core character moment because some people didn't like what the last movie did. Sure, it would have helped for them to plan out the whole trilogy ahead of time, but that's not what doomed these movies. It was a failure to commit to what had already been made. A failure to assert that these stories matter. But apparently, they don't matter. None of this matters. In the movie's grand triumphant moment, we see all the shots from Return of the Jedi recycled as Star Destroyers fall. But I don't feel triumph. I feel like my time has been wasted. We're right back where we were five movies ago. The whole cycle is just going to repeat 30 in-universe years from now, a decade in real-world years from now, when Disney reboots Star Wars again. Because none of this matters. Why does Rey bury Luke's and Leia's lightsabers in the desert of Tatooine, a place both of them only ever wanted to escape from? Because the fans recognize it. Only fan recognition matters. Story integrity doesn't matter. Why does Rey call herself Rey Skywalker when she really had a closer relationship with Han Solo and his son Ben Solo? Because the movie's called Rise of Skywalker, and the path started by Empire's complete because now no one in this universe matters unless they're a Skywalker. But even that will probably get retconned in three years by a comic or a Disney Plus series or something. None of this matters. None of this matters. Somehow Palpatine returned. None of this matters. I'm sorry, I really don't want to leave this video on such a downer note. But the thing is, that's how I feel about Star Wars now. I think Jenny Nicholson said it best. I think the worst thing a franchise ending can do is make you feel kind of stupid and embarrassed for being so excited about it in the first place. Star Wars has been relegated to a punchline in my mind. And that's a shame because when it comes down to it, I still do love that first one from 1977. A B movie with the budget of an A movie. There is something very special in that movie. So charming. So earnest. I've accepted that the franchise won't go in that direction again, because it's a blockbuster megalith owned by a massive media conglomerate hell-bent on shitting out some of the worst movies on the market and packaging them in nice shiny branding to make a billion dollars. But when that makes me angry, I just try to go back and remember that first movie. Again. Imagine knowing nothing about Star Wars, and seeing this tale of a young man in a strange world overcoming evil tyrants. There's a beautiful simplicity to it. It's like a bowl of chicken broth, or a mug of hot chocolate on a winter's day. Before the Force awakened, before the Sith were revenged, before the Empire struck back, there is just this. And honestly, I don't need Star Wars trademark. I just need Star Wars full stop. And that's enough. Oh, wow, that was a long video. Probably not gonna do one like that again. But if you watched all the way through, thank you so much. It means a lot to me. Is there a Star Wars movie that I like that you dislike or vice versa? Tell me about it nicely in the comments below. And if you want to see more videos about movies, you can subscribe for more stuff in the future or follow me on Twitter or Letterboxd for updates of other movies as I watch them. Until next time, I'm Daniel Goldhorn, and thanks for watching.